uh, we'll make a start. Yeah, I just want to say um, good evening, everybody, um, old and new faces that are here this evening. Um, we are looking forward to the t tonight's event. It is an event that we do try to do quite often on our platform because we do believe um, sickle cell is a, a massively important topic and, you know, it has to be put out there as much as possible. So we're just going to bring in Chantelle, who is our first guest speaker for tonight. Yeah, so, um, so I'm Chantelle. Um, I'm basically just going to give you um, an insight into my very, very personal journey of sickle cell, living with sickle cell so far. Um, I'll probably be speaking for about 10, 15 minutes, so bear with me. Um, so yeah, at the moment I work in a college and I'm also an actor as well. And um, it's not always been an easy journey for me. Um, having sickle cell has basically shaped my whole life. Um, I've said in the past, when I've done stuff like this before that I've never wanted, really wanted it to define me or like limit who I am or what I want to do. But in a way, it kind of has. And I used to really, I struggled to come to terms with that. I used to hate that. Um, but now I've kind of accepted it. I've accepted that it is who I am. And things have improved a lot since then with um, medications and having blood exchange transfusions. And I find that now the only limits that I have are kind of the limits that I set myself. Um, but I'll rewind, I'll start at the beginning. Um, so I was diagnosed at birth and I think that finding out that I had sickle cell was obviously a lot harder for, for my parents than it was for me. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I was different because of how they treated me. Um, growing up, they, I was wrapped in cotton wool, sort of. Um, like, they wrapped me up, you know, when it was super warm. I'd be that kid in the hat, the gloves, the scarf, the coat, when everyone else was still in their t-shirts, shorts and t-shirts. Um, they made sure that I took the medications. But I was, I was a happy, you know, carefree child, just loving life. Um, and my childhood was relatively pain-free. Um, you know, I could run, hop, skip, jump, just like every other normal kid. Um, but don't get me wrong, I was never one of those kids that came home with like 100% attendance certificates from school. Because often I was affected with aches and pains and such. But compared to crises that I've had as an adult, um, they were they were nothing. Mm -hmm. um, my parents, along with like the sickle cell counselors in my local area, they always kind of explained my situation to my schools for me in case that I had a crisis and needed urgent medical attention. And I I never told my school friends um, because I didn't want to be the odd one out. And that was kind of a trend that I continued up until I couldn't really hide it anymore. Um, and it's not just the medical aspect of living with a condition, it's the, the life side of it as well. And because there aren't any obvious physical signs, um, people can find it difficult to relate to. So for example, like during my, teen, my late teens and the early twenties, I noticed that whenever I went on a night out, um, it usually resulted in a crisis a day or two afterwards. And also because of the unpredictability of it, um, I found it difficult to make plans. So, for example, I avoided going on holidays with friends because, well, for one, I'm a fussy eater and I always worry about what I'm going to eat when I go abroad and things like that. And the second reason, the main reason, is because I didn't want to become a burden, you know, if I was to have a crisis whilst I was away. And the thought of having one is always in the back of my mind. It, it never, ever, ever leaves me. And if I ever do go away, um, I'm always prepared. So I carry my hospital care plan with me, um, especially if I'm traveling far, so that if the worst was to happen, doctors would know how to treat me. Um, having sickle cell, like I say, it did used to really frustrate me because it stopped me from doing the things that I really wanted to do. Um, so like during uni, I lived at home, but after I graduated uni, I craved independence and adventure. And so I just said, right, I'm moving to London. So I did. Off I went and I knew that moving so far away from my family would be difficult and that I would keep having crises, but I had, I had to try. I was young and I'm glad I did 
I had the most amazing time. It's just a shame that I had to end so soon. So whilst I was working there, um, or whilst I was in London, I was working full time for this small company and I was having crisis after crisis after crisis. And on this one occasion, about eight months in, I was on the phone to management explaining that I was in hospital with yet another crisis. And they basically told me, um, whilst I was in my hospital bed on the phone, they basically told me that they thought it would be best if I looked elsewhere for work. And that one comment kind of, well, it put an end to my London adventure. Um, that one comment made me feel really paranoid. I was wondering, you know, how long they'd been thinking that and it sort of made me feel useless as well. And the sad thing is, that wasn't the first time that sickle cell has affected my work and my prospects. And while I can sort of see it from an employer's perspective, I don't believe that I should be treated any differently just because of something that I was born with and something that I generally have no control over. Um, but while I'm talking about crises, mine didn't really start properly until I hit adulthood and I definitely, definitely wasn't prepared for them. I didn't know what to expect when it happened. Uh, the first one that I remember properly was during my second year at uni. And as well as the pain that come with it, I just remember feeling really, 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 really scared. Um, it was the unknown and I didn't know what to do. And I wasn't entirely sure what was happening to me at the time. And on that occasion, the pain was in me, my back, my lower back. And I was just writhing around. I couldn't stand, couldn't sit. I couldn't lie down. It was just... It, it's hard to find the words to describe sometimes. Even now, I find it difficult just to describe what the pain feels like. Like if I was to say it was just awful, I wouldn't even, it wouldn't explain the severity of how it felt at the time. Um, but then at one point during this period, it just dawned on me and I just remember thinking, is this what a crisis feels like? Because um, I don't remember anybody ever telling me what to expect or what it felt like, but I guess that's difficult because like I say, even now I struggle to explain what they feel like. Um, and that first crisis, it triggered the cycle of constant crises and constant hospitalizations. I had um, my older ones that I could deal with at home, but on those occasions where I couldn't, it meant a trip to the hospital. And there were days when I could not get out of bed. I was literally paralyzed with the pain, struggling for breath, just literally willing it to stop and I, I kept a diary over that period so over that period of about three years during my early to mid-20s I was hospitalized 22 times each for about five nights on average um, and I think my longest stay was about 13 days but going um, just a month without being in hospital was very very rare for me and as well as the physical pain, they affected me mentally as well. And it was a time when I often got frustrated and depressed because living with, living with that pain, it just, it takes its toll on you. And not only was it, you know, crippling and agonizing, but I also regularly got complications which lengthened my recovery time. So I, I used to have got things like bone infections and chest infections, and I had um, a, recall, a recurring leg ulcer as well for three years. Um, but something that helped me stop, or that helped stop the constant crisis cycle of crises and hospitalizations was when I started having regular blood exchange transfusions. Um, they're very different to a normal blood transfusion. And I hope I explained this right because there was a doctor there. So if I don't, then I'm sure he'll, he'll like, correct me. <laughs> um, but they are very different to a normal blood transfusion. And I used to have them regularly once upon a time. Um, so, Exchange transfusions basically are exchanging your blood for someone else's. So basically what happens or what happened for me is um, you get a vas calf, which is basically a huge cannula with like two parts coming out the end of it. And you, they get inserted under local anesthetic into either your groin or your neck. Or the other option is to get a part in your chest. Um, and that means that you don't have to go through getting 
the vas cath in surge and for me that was every seven weeks under local anesthetic um so through one of the pots my blood was being taken out um put through a machine and having the sickle cells removed with the clean blood being put back in or clean sickle free blood being put back in and at the same time through the other part I was getting 10 units of donor blood um put into my body as well um and that was because obviously the, I was getting less of my own blood back so I needed topping up at the same time um but having the blood the blood exchanges even though they were quite intrusive they Honestly, they changed my life. They started um, not long after I'd moved back home from London while I was still in the cycle of being in the constant pain and not being able to work either. So having the exchanges, yeah, basically turned my life around. And I noticed the change almost immediately where I was in a situation where I got really, really cold. And normally I would have, it would have turned into a crisis, um, but it didn't. And I did have tiny crises, but they seemed to pass really, really quickly. And I didn't need pain relief generally for them ones either. So uh, um, yeah, that's why I think blood donors are really, really important. Um, they literally save lives and change lives, especially donors from a black background where there's a shortage of people who have the same blood type as people who need it, like myself. Um, and if there was a way that I could personally thank every single one of the donors that I've ever had, we'd be here for a very, very long time. But I am genuinely, genuinely grateful for every single one of them. Um, unfortunately for me though, so I was only able to have the, the transfusions for about two to three years. Um, because having the vas cast inserted into my groin regularly left me with a lot of scar tissue. So each time it was getting harder and harder for the surgeons to operate on me. Um, so this meant that obviously there come a time when we had to agree to try another method um, to continue having the blood exchanges would have meant that I'd either have to have the vas cath inserted into my neck and if you know me I am very squeamish when it comes to I don't even like having a blood test so if I was to like I wouldn't be able to sit still long enough basically for someone to come at me with a big old needle to stick in my neck that's just a no-no and the other option is was the part to have the part fitted into my chest um and the part is basically the size of like i'd say your average car key these days and it, it goes under the skin on your the top part of your chest and it just sits there and it can last for about 10 years and i'm that again that's not really an option for me because i'm very vain but then also i'm not very fleshy when it comes to this area so i just wouldn't want you know a lump kind of sticking in places where you don't really want lumps and bumps but it's not something that I'll fully fully rule out it may well be something that I'll come back to in the future um because like I say having those exchanges lifesavers so in the meantime I'm having I'm taking hydroxycarbamide daily which is keeping me well and virtually crisis free but if ever that was to stop working, I would definitely go back to the part option. Um, Cause yeah, that's that's the way forward, I think. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where I'm at right now with my journey with sickle cell. Um, yeah, living with it, it, it's tough. You know, people have called me brave in the past, but I don't, don't see it as bravery. Um, I didn't have a choice really to be going through what I went through, but my journey has got better and easier um, and I've kind of put my whole life really into like that like 10 minutes but there was a lot more that I could have said but I don't really want to uh, we could have gone any kind of route but yeah basically these days I try and avoid triggers which my triggers which are stress and cold um, but more importantly I'm just trying to like live my life and just make the most of it and live it as full as I can so yeah, in a nutshell, that is me. Thank you, Chantal. That was great. Um, it was nice getting your perspective of how you live with sickle cell. And, you know, you're, you're a young girl as well, you know, young lady now. And, you know, to have come through all what you've come through. 
and the and stressing as well the importance of blood donation. Um, we on our website we have a constant blood donation advert up there section, its own little section, because we want to trigger that to anybody that comes to the website and they read our website and they see that blood donation. It might just trigger one per if it triggers one person's mind and think, oh maybe I should try and get blood, and they do. That is a result for us because we know, like you stressed, it is vital, it is so important. Sickle cell sufferers, they need it, you know, and I've told you before, my brother-in-law, he passed away with sickle cell. His three other brothers had sickle cell. They've passed away with it as well. I've seen what it does to people and I've seen the importance of blood donation. So, yeah, really appreciate that and appreciate how how you opened up as well and spoke about how you were made to feel at work and about how you thought, well, how long have they been thinking like that? All them things to go through your mind and them sort of obstacles and things to overcome on top of suffering with sickle cell. You know, take my hat off to you. You know, you've done well. So I really, really appreciate you coming here this evening and telling us your story. Oh, thank you for having me. Like I say, it's not easy. But, it's a pleasure. Know, better, so yeah, thank yep. you. Are you open to answering a few questions as well? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I don't yeah. know if other people have got um, questions they want to type in the chat or, or, or mute I'll themselves. I'll just put your hand up. Or, yeah. Yep. Uh, I'll get us started if I can. But you, you mentioned something I, I wasn't aware um, happened. You said the sickle cell counsellors used to speak to the school. Um, do you want to share a bit more info about that? Yeah, so um, in Bradford, ever since I remember, there's always been a sickle cell haemoglobinopathy, I think the word is, counsellor. And they're basically like, um, they work more in the community, in the community rather than in the hospital with you. So if ever, like, there was something, like, for example, going to speak to the schools, um, and you needed advice or whatever, it would be them you would call to do that for you. Uh, and equally, um, if there's something like work employment, um, they'd help you with that as well. Um, because obviously they know, they're more educated than that. My parents, for example, they just know what they're told sort of thing, rather than everything that they can pass on to the schools and stuff. Um, so having the, the counselors there is really important. Um, in terms of for your own from <laughs> welcome um and thank you um in terms of being able to i've lost my train of thought now what was i saying uh, sc uh, the school counselors being able to translate i think to the schools oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah so um it's easy to, and just having someone in your corner to kind of back you up essentially because it's not always you're not always listened to especially when you're on your own. Um, and because it is such a misunderstood condition, if I'm explaining something to, or if my parents are explaining something to school, having um, the counsellors there to, you know, back them up and explain, this is the situation, this is what she needs, this is what you should do, this is who you should call. Um, it kind of just gives it a bit more, um, it just makes, yeah, it's just, it's just good to have them in your corner. So I think... I remember when I was in London, I don't really remember anything other than being as active as the ones up here. But the ones that we've had in Bradford, I can't, honestly, they've been, they've been amazing. And literally, they'll just, yeah, they'll help you as much as they can, whenever they can. Okay. And um, thanks for sharing that. And um, my sister is Claire. Um, she's got um, she's got a camera switched on, I think, there, yeah. But my nephew's got sickle cell, so we're still trying to adjust to yeah. um, changes. So, um, Claire, you may want to look into that um, counselling, counsellor service. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sticking with education as well, um, Chantel, you mentioned the attendance at university. Did, did they um, give you any sort of support as well for that? Uni were amazing, actually. Um, so during my first year, everything was fine. Didn't need to kind of tell anyone. You, I put it on my application forms and such, so like they knew. But when I first started having the crisis, that's when I kind of thought, this is when I need need to be more open. Yeah. 
and when I might need kind of support and stuff. So I did go to see the disability people at uni and they literally could not have done more for me. They helped me to access um, grants that I didn't know I was entitled to, uh, government grants. I got, I ended up getting um, extra funding and extra kind of support in exams, extra time in exams and stuff like that. And, you know, taxes to and from uni. So that all helped. I didn't um, use all of it, but having the taxes there, you know, to avoid the cold so that I wasn't stood at bus stops or train stations, which is where sometimes I would get a crisis because it was too cold out there. Um, having extra time, because obviously having sickle, you're anemic and you can feel tired and stuff. So that kind of helped. I didn't use it all the time, just when I really, really needed to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they honestly, they couldn't have done enough for me. They That's were, cool. I'm glad that I was open with them. And then... Um, they also got me funding for a laptop because a lot of the time I had crises and they were in my wrists, so I couldn't type and I couldn't write. So they got me access to a laptop which had um, software that I could just speak to the computer and it would write my essays for me and things like that. So that also was um, a life life server as well. It, it made my uni life a lot easier and a lot bearable that they, they was able to help me like that. Thanks, Chantel. Um, no, that really does help. And and the last one for me was about the hospital care plan. So was that has that changed as you've um, gone through um, adulthood? Is it, is it the same plan from teenager to early twenties? I'm guessing. Um, but is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it basically just kind of outlines what needs to be done on like an emergency basis. So if um, if I need to call if all of my pain relief methods are failing at home. Um, it kind of tells the paramedics what they need to do and then also what the a &E staff need to do. Um, so it's more that basis, really. There's also, like, a ward plan attached to mine so that the ward know what they need to do. Um, but where I am in Bradford, um, kind of everybody knows me. I'm on, like, a because I've been there so often. Um, I'm on first, first name terms with some of the nurses, so they kind of know when I'm what I need and when I'm not right and when I need extra extra kind of pain relief and stuff um but yeah when I go away so like when I was in London having that plan um was super super useful because they didn't know me down there they didn't know what um my personal care needed and um, they just had you know their overall how they deal with sickle cell sort of thing and um, so having a personalized care plan is yeah I think that's a necessity as well yeah. yeah I agree with the care plan I've got a care plan so I've got a stomach condition a rare stomach condition mm -hmm. and it's the same with me so if I go into hospital because I was in and out of hospital for quite a few years the care plan explains the drugs and what's needed to alleviate the symptoms that I've come in with and what have you and they're so important like you said yeah. I think it just saves a lot of stress undue stress on yourself that's you know having that care plan in place most definitely that's great and it's not really something that they can ignore because it's yeah. their headed hospital nhs paper yeah so um yeah if there was to ignore it then that would be, that would not be a good thing so mm -hmm. yeah kind of rules that they have to follow mm -hmm. okay so um, there's a question in the chat, Corinne, I don't know if you want to um, ask a question or if you want us to read it out, but I know we've got a doctor here that may answer some of the questions, so I can ask it. Yeah. I can ask. Hey, Chantelle, you all right, lovely? Yeah, thank you, yeah. Okay, yes, yeah, so, and maybe Dr. Uh, Dr. Kamara might be able to uh, help as well. I was just wondering whether or not... Um, is, is there scope, is there an option of bone marrow transplant? Would that help to alleviate any sickle cell symptoms? Is, is that one of the treatments possibly? Uh, thank you so much for, um, for having me. I think you'd probably be better off if you um, probably saw the presentation and maybe okay. get the answer to that question. Fantastic. 
Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, Thank you. What? Um, I was just going to play a short video. Just it's only a few minutes long. Uh, just just in between the segue. So if you'll bear with me, I'll just play it very quickly. I think it's four minutes long, um, but it's just about um, my nephew, as I was saying, that's also suffers with sickle cell. What's your name? Devare. And how old are you? Seven. Seven. We need to find the cure for sickle cell. Hello, Davare. Hello, Dante. Hello, Sis. How are you? Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 So the reason I've asked you to come and speak to us today is just to talk about um, uh, Davare and his sickle cell. So um, how was Davare diagnosed? When did you first realise he had sickle cell? Um, this, when the midwife came out to check on him, um, they said he was it when he came out. Um, he was a bit yellow. His eye pupils were a bit yellow, so he had to have the heel prick done. Hey. Um, yeah, and that was done at home. And they just had to a bit got sickle cell. Okay. So did, did they say that he had full blown sickle cell, or did they say that he had the trait at that stage? No, no, they said they didn't actually say anything to at the stage. They just said that they're just checking to see um, why he's a bit joined us. So they never actually mentioned sickle cell at the time. Um, they just said he was a bit joined us. So when they went back and they had the test done with the field, it came back that he was he was um, fully blown sickle cell. Okay. Um, and how's it affected his day to day life? Hi, Devare. Um, can um can't play as long as um, other children, and sometimes in the summertime he um, feels cold a lot, don't yeah? You yeah you. Right, so um whereas um, other children can be playing um outside for the whole day, well Davari can um, he'll get tired. Yeah. Uh, it's like walking. Um, he um, can't walk very far, he gets tired and he will have pain in his legs. Yeah. Um, and, and how have you found the NHS? Have, have the NHS been um, able to help in any way? Um, with the medication that he's on, um, it's, they say that it seems to be helping him. Yeah. Um, but I do... I do um, when like in the winter time it gets worse in the winter so i try um we try to stay in in the winter yeah it's cold when it's raining um we try to be outside because um it could have a crisis in a rainstorm and so uh, but i don't re i don't get any help for government um basically i've just had to um I had to learn to drive and so that he's not walking a lot. Yeah, yeah. I've had to do it myself, just keep him warm. When you've been to the doctors, is it Huddersfield that's been really helpful or have you had to go further afield? Um, I go to Halifax. The only hospital now that I go to is Halifax. I used to have to go all the way to Leeds. Yeah. Um, but I, I told them that, because um, I don't get any help, um, I told them it's not too much to go to Leeds every minute. Um, yeah. Because I'm not a confident driver, we used to have to um, park halfway and then get the bus. Yeah. So it was quite a trick that was. So now we just have Halifax appointments. Okay. And um, how are the school when it comes to Davari's um, um, symptoms? Are they well aware and do they ever get involved? They kind of panic. Most of the times when he does have a temperature panic and they end up calling me to um, bring him home. So when I bring him home, all it is is you just need to get um, bring his temperature down. They really do panic because there's not a lot of awareness yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, 
um thanks for your patience there and uh, thanks sis for taking part in that video um mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I think at this point we'll bring uh, Dr. Mohammed in and then uh, if you want to speak as well uh, uh, during the event, Claire, that'd be really helpful. Mm. No pressure. Can I just say something actually, sorry. Mm. Huh? When Claire was saying about, is it, De what's his De name, sorry? Devare. De Devare. Devare. <laughs> it could literally have um, a crisis in a rainstorm. That actually happened to me. I was at Notting Hill Carnival of all places and um started to rain and... I literally started, could start, I could feel my body start to go. So I was with my cousin at the time and he went into a Sainsbury's, got me some paracetamol and ibuprofen. And then we decided to get the train back home. So I was on the train, I popped all these pills, just struggling. And then I got picked up from the train station. And got, when I got to Bradford, about two hours later, two, three hours later, I got brought straight to, straight to the hospital. So things like that actually do happen. Mm -hmm. And just like, with you saying that, it just triggered that memory. Um, so I think a lot, just stuff like this, raising the awareness that it could literally happen anywhere. You could be anywhere and these things happen. So, yeah. yeah. Know, <laughs> Definitely. Thank Thanks, Chantelle. Um, okay, um, Mohammed, thank you again for coming along this evening. And if you'd like to introduce yourself and take the stage, so to say. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can follow what Chantelle has done. But um, we see how it. In fact, I must say, uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not even sure which way I can pitch this talk, as the talk involves a lot of um, facets of of the illness, and, and whether I should focus on just, you know, the the um, the pathology, i.e., the the cause of the problem, how it is whether I should focus on the disease proper or whether uh, the prognosis or maybe, uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, the, 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 what do you call them, the groups, you know, that would actually um, look into trying to create the awareness and sensitize the population out there. So my, my talk is actually styled in, uh, in a format whereby there are myths surrounding this um, sickle cell, and so I've actually gone through them one after the other just to you know try and dispel this myths and things like that. Uh, instantly, Chantelle has done a fantastic job because she has got a lived experience. There's nothing more powerful than someone who's actually living it. And I remember not wanting to digress, there's a song by Jimmy Cliff, you know, where he says, Who feels it knows it. And I think it resonates with a lot of people. If you listen to the lyrics, I think you would uh, understand where I'm coming from. Incidentally, Mark, shame about the cushion you have there. <laughs> it's always yeah. a conversation uh, icebreaker. How can you say that after yesterday, Mohammed? <laughs> it's fantastic. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won the anyway. shield. <laughs> Come shield, all right. No problems. <laughs> right. You want to allow me to share then, I'll try and whiz through this, All right? <laughs> so, uh, you would notice the, the name, well, body better past gentry, that is in pigeon, it's in uh, Creole, uh, which indicates that uh, health is better than wealth. Um, this is, you know, in, in our lingua franca, it's Creole, because originally I'm from Sierra Leone, and I sort of lead a group uh, that um, looks into, you know, health and the welfare and equality and equity of our people's health. So this is a presentation that I did for them. And again, on sickle cell. So, so that's why you would see that. And there's no conflict of interest, I must um, add. All right. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, I like presenting with icebreakers because it sort of homes in on the subject matter. So, of course, I don't know, I might be teaching my grandparents to suck eggs, but <laughs> I'm sure it's important for us to identify why is it we're talking about this because somebody uh, discovered it. And, and normally it's important to pay homage to these people. So who first identified or discovered sickle cell? And I'm proud to say that 
this chap, you know, uh, Africanus Horton, uh, is from Sierra Leone of uh, Igbo parentage and uh, wrote this book of his, The Diseases of Tropical Climates and Their Treatment in 1874. That was long, way, way long before uh, the British chap, uh, James Herrick, actually wrote his, you know, which was, you know, Western Discovery in 1910. So obviously, sickle cell, you may well be aware, maybe you right, may well know what it is. I mean, sickle cell anemia, just to remind ourselves, is a disorder, it's a disorder of the blood caused by an inherited abnormal hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin is a protein that we have in the, in the blood, uh, which helps to carry the oxygen you know, and the nutrients to the necessary parts of the body and uh, take away carbon dioxide after the metabolism has actually occurred. So the waste products are taken away by it, you know, and of course the nutrients are taken to it. So the, 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 the normal, um, if you say, uh, lifespan average is 120 days for a red blood cell uh, because of one thing, they're rounded, as you can see, they're round. So they easily glide through the blood vessels, you know, be it artery or vein. And if you slice it in the middle, that's what you see, something like that. Whereas with a sickle, and aptly named sickle, because you could see that they're shaped like a sickle, and that's where the name comes from. Because they are abnormal, uh, they swell quickly, and they are prone to rupturing. Therefore, the possibility of someone with sickle cell uh, having to need renewal a lot more frequently than somebody who's got normal cells, so to speak. So in effect, instead of it being 120, which is three times a year, if my maths is correct, uh, it normally would be more than that, maybe five, five, six times. And that in itself has got, is fraught with its own, you know, risks and problems. So that's the chap we talked about. And on the left there, you can you can see the guy, if you go into the University of Edinburgh, you'd actually see this plaque in honor of this chap. And as I said, originally from Sierra Leone of Igbo parents, and uh, the chap on the right is the one that highlighted in 1910. So, icebreaker two, is this myth that only people of African ancestry can have sickle cell disease? Well, lo and behold, although mostly affects people of African ancestry, it is one that is known to affect people from different regions around the world for a few reasons, intermarriages, migration, you name it, you know. So epidemiology wise, you can see that 5% of the world population harbors all these alleles of the hemoglobinopathies, which is what Chantel uh, alluded to, which means hemoglobin, as we said, is the uh, heme. If you look at it in Latin, heme or H-E-M is, 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 is blood and globin is a protein. And anything that ends in pathies, like you hear pathology and all that means abnormal. So it's a, an abnormal protein in the blood. That's what hemoglobin, hemoglobinopathies mean. So judging from that, you can see why it's important for us to be actually uh, sensitizing people about uh, um, sickle cell. So 300,000 children every year annually are born with this hemoglobinopathy. And 200,000 children are born in Africa alone with sickle cell disease. So you can understand the significance and the symbolism of why we definitely need to be, you know, not rest on our laurels of what we've gained so far, but actually continue, uh, you know, a quest into uh, the, the point where we talked about this uh, uh, bone marrow transplant and even to the point where in vivo, like when the baby, the embryo is in the baby, in mom's belly, where they can actually do some surgery and actually try and uh, ensure that that child's life is, is fulfilled in terms of, you know, uh, um, what they achieve. So, so these are all things that we'll, we'll talk about as we go on, really. But look at the prevalence in sub-Saharan Africa. You can see that the sickle cell trait is up to 40%. And of course, the disease is, is equal to or slightly less than 2% with the highest rates in Ghana, Nigeria, and Uganda. These are facts. They're not made up. So you can find, as I say, because of the migration and of course intermarriages and things like that, you can find sickle cell, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, Saudi Arabia, 
surprise, surprise. And of course, in Asia, India, you know, Mediterranean countries as well, like Italy, Greece, and Turkey, have all known to have them. And if you look at that, you'd see that Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, Trump, you know, leads the way, more than 5 million people. Yeah. So one thing that is poignant, and, and it's good to remember this, is that I don't know what the link is, but people are saying that wherever you have malaria on the right is probably where you'd have sickle cell. And what's the link is probably for the um, hematologists, but that's something that they're working on. I think they've looked at that. The belt of the distribution of malaria is one that is reciprocal to, or almost to, to the one of sickle cell. So icebreaker three is this myth about sickle cell being contagious. Sadly, it isn't. You know, it's an inherited disorder, a blood disorder that is inherited. And so uh, the, what it means is it can be passed from parents to children, not from grandparents, I'm, I hasten to add. And it's not because of a curse on the mother or the father. This is just something they themselves have inherited from their fathers and mothers. And so therefore the current child or the current third generation or fourth or fifth have actually inherited it from, you know, immediately from the parents themselves. So this is a very important slide. I think this is the, the slide that actually is the, the slide of the talk, as it were. You've got the trait and you've got the sickle cell. So if you look at this, what they've done in this slide is really good, is that on the left there, you can see the dad being a trait, i.e. is just one, one gene, uh, one, one, one of the genes is faulty, i.e. carrying, and, and, and the mother hasn't got it. She's normal. So when they have children, for every pregnancy, there is a 50% chance of the children, i.e., you know, half would probably develop the trait, so they will be born with the trait. And another 50% out of the 100 would actually be normal. So I hope that's clear. And then you go on the other hand, you have the mom and the dad bring people with the trait. So you've got, on the other hand there, just the dad, and now you have the mom and the dad. And in such a case, you have 50% chance of every pregnancy, I repeat, I want to emphasize, it doesn't mean four children, it's every pregnancy. Yeah, there's a 50% chance of the children being uh, ones that have the trait, and one, which is 25% uh, of the full blown disease, and another 25% of uh, normality. So 25% normal, 25% full blown sickle cell, and of course 50% uh, 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 of the trait. Then you can see here. You've got dad who is a full-blown sickle cell and mom is normal. And what you have is what? You have a 100% possibility that the child that would be uh, born of those parents is possibly going to carry a trait. And here you have the dad being a full-blown sickle cell and uh, mom being a trait and when you when they when they get children, there is the possibility of fifty percent for every pregnancy being the ones with the trait, and of course the other fifty percent of the ones who would actually have the full blown uh, illness. Now this is the main one where both of them have got sickle cell, mom and dad, and in such a case there is the one hundred percent chance that the child that would you know ensue or come from this uh, couple would definitely more likely to actually develop that. So I hope this is clear. I might be speaking too fast because, you know, there's a few more slides to go through, but this is the slide of the talk and maybe we can go back to it if there are any questions. Right, as breaker four. So there is only one type of sickle cell disease. Sadly, there isn't just one. There are actually several types of sickle cell disease, including and not limited to, you know, the sickle cell, uh, thalassemia beta, and of course the SS and the most common one, the most common ones are these ones, the HB uh, sickle cell, the HBS, beta thalassemia, and the HBSS. Well, there's a lot more, as you can see, the one with the, you know, there's so many of them. So 
that brings us to the symptoms and signs of sickles. And I see, I think Chantel delved into this quite well. So if you can see, it's like a top to toe uh, effect, you know, it has. Uh, you can see that uh, if it's the brain, people can sometimes develop strokes. I've seen people at the age of 10 and people at the age of 12 months, you know, a year old actually, you know, having a stroke, developing a stroke. And that would probably sometimes can lead to uh, mental uh, disability, if you like. And of course, it can affect the eyes, as you can see, and that can cause, you know, retinopathy, whereby that can lead to, you know, problems with vision and sometimes even blindness. And if you go into the lungs, you can see that there are people, I mean, the, the, the illness is such that they were prone because of the immune suppression, the immune deficiency, they'd be prone to pneumonia. And, and that could then lead to pulmonary infarct when you have this chest syndrome uh, where you've got chest pain and obviously because of blood flow being, um, you know, obscured and, you know, and altered, you can actually have problems with the, uh, the respiration and ventilation. Uh, if it affects the heart, which we know because of the fact that when they're anemic, the, 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 the blood is not being pumped to the organs of the body as readily as required. Therefore, the heart has to pump a, a bit more. So it's like if it's to be allowed to beat normally between 60 and 100, you now have something like 110, 120, maybe more than that, in order to accommodate the needs of the body. In so doing, if you imagine you go to the gym, obviously, when you pump the ion, you know, you build the muscle and that's what happens to the left side of the heart. It gets bigger. And in so doing, it gets to the point where it begins to um, sort of default or maybe falter. And that causes what we call uh, congestive heart failure. And of course, because the blood is being changed frequently, there is the distinct possibility of, you know, gallstones. This is the gallbladder you can see here uh, under the liver. So that can actually be a tendency to happen you know, gallstones, and when you eat something fatty, obviously the gallstones can actually cause problems with the pain and the right upper quadrant, and nausea, vomiting, and the likes of it. Of course, uh, because of the issues surrounding the spleen on the left, uh, sometimes you can get um, atrophy where the blood supply is limited, and as a result, uh, the, 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 the spleen can die of, of its own natural death, which is called autosplenectomy. So then, of course, you are now prone to infection as a result, you have to be taking antibiotics. Some people you may have seen have been taking um, penicillin for the rest of their lives because they've lost uh, the, 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 the use of their spleen. And, and, and that is what could happen with uh, multiple crises and things like that uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in the sickle cell disease. Normally you'd have to have it removed because of trauma, but because of the recurrent infarct that takes place on the spleen, uh, that can die on its own and that can cause that problem, you see. Then, of course, you've got, uh, again, blood supply to the, to the kidneys, which would then probably sometimes manifest uh, it, themselves in the blood in the urine. So if you've got, like, blood in the urine, or sometimes it can cause stones in the kidney. And, of course, the blood flow can be uh, sort of impacted, and as a result, you get infarct, you know. Then, of course, the blood flow to the extremities, like the fingers, the toes, you know, blockage of that can sometimes lead to a breakdown of the skin and people are aware of ulcers forming in the lower legs, you know, because of a lack of blood flow to and fro. And of course the bone marrow, uh, because it's being asked to do more than its fair share, can go into overdrive, which is what we call hyperplasia. And that in itself is fraught uh, with a lot of complications because the immune system is not as robust as it should be. Then of course, because of the lack of blood supply to the bone, you find there's what we call necrosis, that's the death of the bone, because the bone would be dead without the blood vessel that supplies the, bl the blood to it. So if you get the blood being occluded in the, 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 the artery or the vein, definitely the, the bone would die. And that's what you call a septic necrosis, because the necrosis means it's dead, but a septic means it's not infected. Normally, like osteomyelitis, infection of the bone is what would actually give rise to that. But in this particular case, because of the lack of blood, that he actually dies a natural death, you know, and that in itself can sometimes, because of the superimposed infection, can give rise to osteomyelitis. You can see that children, you know, develop stunted growth, you know, the damage to the eye, and as I say, all sorts of things. So from top to bottom, you have possibility of being affected. So I've said a lot. Now, 
just look at this and read this video maybe just as a I hope that was useful. Uh, I enjoyed that, and that's why I included it. Then that brings us nicely to the antenatal screening, which is absolutely vital. You know, so in, you know when people are sort of thinking about you know starting families and things like that, and obviously that culminates in pregnancy. It is important to have the antenatal screening, which is offered. So the blood is you know sent for the screening, and of course, if you get positive results, you get the information, and obviously you're offered counselling, and then obviously. Your partner then gets screened as well and again it involves sending of the blood you know uh, for screening and then information uh, is actually given to you and counseling offered if you have positive tests that is the, the, the couple that are very much at risk really and of course you have what we call prenatal diagnosis so if at all there was nothing there but there is the suspicion then they can do a fetal blood sampling or they can do chorionic bilo sampling now that in itself uh, is fraught with uh, you know risks as well it, 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 it's definitely important to mention that because sometimes that can lead to miscarriages and things like that but there are newer techniques which are available in the nhs like the implantation you know and all of that we'll talk about if we have time but uh, mainly that's how they do uh, they will tell you you know that it's not without risk but i'm sure you'd understand that wherever you go into something and you sort of aim at nature, nature has a way of fighting back, really. And of course, if you have a situation where you have an affected fetus, then again, information and counseling. And then, of course, the, the parents would have to be informed as to uh, what choices they have. And they would go into making that decision, you know, uh, fully aware, you know, of the, the, the possibilities and the options they have, really. So that's just the test what is done really and how it's done um but I, I i thought it was important maybe you've got mothers to be here so it's important to look at sickle cell from the point of view of the infant the good thing about the infant i.e uh, less than six months old is that the the, the fetal blood is absent in the red cells uh, uh, you know so so it's only at five to six months that you normally get the the, the, the first uh, you know or the onset of these you know uh, painful swelling of the hand and you can see the difference between the right hand and the left hand there you can see in the picture is that the right hand is swollen is shiny obviously in pain you can see the little one on the left where it's not affected you can see that so that's what we call dactylitis and, and you can see that definitely uh, but that normally kicks off at six months to two years so what you would normally do with these ones is uh, hydration pain management and keeping a close eye on them so that it doesn't progress if it does progress then obviously you'd want to take them to a hospital where they'll be looked after so signs and symptoms as i say uh, you would see that sometimes if it's the chest uh, they have you know uh, uh, breathing problems you know the shorter breath they have increased work of breathing they might complain of chest pain you know and they may develop a fever so obviously when you take them to the hospital they would want to uh, do some, especially in the ED where I work, I'm an a &E consultant, uh, you would then obviously want to give them adequate analgesia. Uh, whilst doing that, obviously, you'd want to get the blood cultures, which is important. That's something they forget most of the time. Because if you give the antibiotics without the blood cultures being taken up front, then what you're doing is you're masking the possibility of yielding that response in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the culprit, i.e. The, the causative bug that would have caused this particular crisis and of course painkillers 100 percent you need oxygen because they have problem breathing so most of the time that's one thing they do as well they don't give them the oxygen and it's important to remember that that these people if they have 
uh, an oxygen saturation of 94, 95%, that is not normal. You need to top it up because it should be in the eight, in the 98s and things like that. So it's important for us to actually, you know, pass this message on, especially when someone has got uh, a management plan. Most of the nurses sometimes, well, I wouldn't say most, but some of the nurses who are just newly qualified, lack of experience, even nurses who are just qualified, maybe they have not been exposed to the dangers of, of sickle cell, would sometimes, you know, uh, underplay the seriousness of this. And as I say, time is, is of the essence in this particular situation. It actually would save someone to go into a full-blown multi-organ failure if you act in time. Because if you give the antibiotics in time, you rehydrate them in time, you give them the adequate analgesia, clearly you would be saving their lives and you'd be actually making sure the complications that set in would actually be abated. Anemia, as we see, they're being pale. In the darker complexion, in people of color, it's sometimes very difficult. But if you look under the tongue and you pull back the eyelid, the lower one, you probably would uh, you know, appreciate the pallor. You know? And of course, one thing that actually accompanies that is the you know, fatigue, getting tired easily. Again, breathing problems because they're anemic, they have to compensate for the low blood as it were. And of course, as I said, we talked already about stunted, stunted growth. And of course, uh, puberty sets in later on, you know, in comparison to the ones that don't have it. Again, the, the, the treatment includes antibiotics, blood transfusions, like uh, Chantelle has alluded to. The hand foot syndrome, we talked about already, where you have the pain and, you know, coldness to the hand and feet. And of course, you know, pain medication and liquid and fluids to, to treat that. Infection, absolutely vital. You act in time, you know. Make sure they're, they're up to date with all their vaccines, the antibiotics of choice, uh, you know, and, and of course, prevent them from getting infection between two months to five years. Again, you, you get the pain. Uh, we talked about the, the spleen as well, you know, the splenic crisis. That is one thing. If they complain of pain on the left side of the belly with weakness and a rapid heart, uh, the tachycardic, then definitely you need to be rushing them to hospitals in order to be uh, treated to make sure we save the, the spleen. Otherwise, it might end up with a splenectomy, and therein lies the danger where they will have to have antibiotics for the rest of their lives. Visual problems as well. And as I told you already, I've seen children as young as one, two years develop a stroke. So if you see them, you know, you know, holding onto their heads and maybe have weakness on one side of the body, and they're not as alert as they have been, and in older children, there's a speech uh, deficit, maybe they're slurring, and the is not as good as you were, then obviously you need to be taking them to hospital, rushing them as, as, as soon as you can. The adolescent one is not as much different from the, 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 the youngsters, i.e. the infants, you know, but sometimes they develop this uh, necrosis, which, as I say, is not related to infection. And of course, they can get problems with their eyesight and of course the leg ulcers, which, talked, which we talked about already. But this is the most important thing to remember in the adolescents the acute chest syndrome. It's a leading cause of death. And I want you to pay particular attention to that. Absolutely vital. Someone's got a uh, you know, full-blown sickle cell and they're complaining of chest, pain, shortness of breath. Please, 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 and pretty please rush them to hospital because you could just save their lives by doing that. You know, and that is something that we don't treat well in the hospitals. a and &E is sometimes faulty uh, you know, because of the fact that the, either lack of knowledge, uh, the lack of availability, uh, the lack of uh, uh, information or what, but it's something that needs to be honed in on in terms of how we manage people in acute crisis. Icebreaker five. Well, people think it's a short term condition. Well, I disagree. Uh, people will have it for their entire lives. There's no questions about that. You know, the crisis under good management may be short lived the people definitely would have that because it's present at birth, manifest itself at six months, and for the rest of their lives will have that. So what do we do then? You know, in terms of treatment, remember, because they're immunocompromised, it's important to be up to date with the vaccines. The one that you actually remember is the meningococcal vaccine, because they're immunocompromised, they're prone to uh, meningitis you know, in crowded areas, in, in dormitories, in universities and things like that, even in places like Hajj, you know, those that go for pilgrimage, you know, uh, you need mococcal vaccine, again, because the chest is the only organ that communicates with the outside world 20 times a minute, 
it is most at risk. That is why even people who've got HIV and AIDS, one of the, the, the most dangerous things uh, that would kill them is pneumonia, because that is the organ that communicates with the outside world. And of course, a telling point is COVID, as you can see what has happened. Folic acid is absolutely vital to boost the immune system. Blood transfusion, as Chantel has actually alluded to, is important that it becomes a bit of a problem because financially, you know, psychologically, uh, socially, and you know, morally, and otherwise, it becomes a big problem because it's fraught with its own complications and problems. Now, we talked about, you know, someone asked the question, uh, bone marrow transplant. Well, we look at it. Stem cell transplant is one thing that is being bandied about now. There's something that is being offered in certain hospitals or certain trusts in certain areas in the country. Analgesia, 100%. Don't give paracetamol or brufen to someone in crisis. You're wasting the time and you are definitely not doing them any uh, favors by doing that. You need something strong, something morphine. And as I said, not, 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 don't give it by mouth, give it through the vein because it acts a lot quicker. And one thing that person will thank you for is uh, alleviating that pain, relieving that pain as soon as possible. And that is why some of the patients will not go to hospital by themselves they actually would want to wait for an ambulance. They can actually uh, wait at home for another 20, 30 minutes, but at least they know when the ambulance crew comes, they'll give them the injection and, and that would relieve the problem. And when they come in through the ambulance, they know they're treated a lot quicker and a lot more seriously. Take, they take it more seriously and therefore they'll get the, the, the repetitive, the repetitive uh, uh, fluids as well as the, uh, the blood taken as well as the, the painkillers, because you're not just giving the painkillers, but you want to make sure you check whether it's been effective or not. And if it has been, as the pain dropped from 10 to 4 to 2 to 3, and what you're aiming for is the lower figures. And, and that means you have to check to see the efficacy. And if it's less, then obviously you might need some topping up. And if you can't give morphine because of the fact that it has its own side effects, that it causes problems with the breathing, it drops the blood pressure and affects uh, other things like constipation and all that, then perhaps what you can do is provide what we call patient-controlled analgesia, where they have the pump on their hands and they can actually, you know, just click on it when the time is right. Ketarolac is another one. And of course, don't forget the antibiotics, which are uh, important there. You know, and of course, hydroxyurea. Now, I don't know whether Chantel has had the use of that, but that's one thing that is very, very common. And it's been known, this is a fact, it's been uh, specifically been known to reduce uh, the, 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 the recurrence, i.e. the crises that you do have, hydroxyurea, if you use it properly and you're compliant with it religiously, you actually would have a lower uh, turnover in terms of shortening uh, the, the remission uh, or, you know, or stalling uh, the relapses. Erythropoietin obviously is important because it helps the kidneys uh, from failure. That it helps to generate the blood, which is what you require. Uh, some people say niprosan is a herbal product. I don't recommend that, you know, but I had to put it there for people to have the option and to see what it is. Um, there is also conflicting evidence about magnesium supplementation as a therapeutic measure. You know, the use of uh, clotrimazole because of the fact that you have superimposed, you know, fungal infections, and so therefore it might improve things. Now, this is still uh, at the research stages, you know. Uh, hematopoietic cell transplantation is currently the only curative option for, you know, uh, uh, sickle cell disease patients. Uh, but the use of this therapy, as I say, is, is quite uh, in its early stages. You know, and of course, now, as I told you already, there's gene therapy. It has the potential to be curative, but it's still experimental. So nutrition, as you can see, there's a lot there. And I think people are doing that already. And um, this is one thing I wanted to just home in on for you to know the take home message, as it were, you know, it is when the red blood cell is normal, it's red. And when it's sickle cell affected, you can see it's shaped like a sickle. And as I said, uh, uh, normally 120 that it takes, but then you can see it, it, it 10 to 20 days is what that last one. So therefore there's an increase, you know. So uh, you know how you get it. You can see that, but 300,000 babies worldwide born with sickle cell disease every year is something to be, you know, uh, addressed, really. There's no questions about that. So if you have got, you know, the possibility of being a bone marrow donor or a blood donor, please, 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 you know, do uh, 
uh, get involved in that because I mean, a lot of people don't know that uh, Denmark Road, uh, just off Wilbram, not Wilbram, but Wil 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 Wilmslow Road, opposite the MRI, is where the center is. And you can go in there and get that done for you. No questions about that. But look at this. Out of every 12 African American, yeah, there are one, or there is one who carries the sickle cell, you know, trait. And, and look at the Hispanics, 36,000. And, you know, but, but, but look at what we have, African American, 12, just 12. So it just tells you. So if there is an emergency, there's pain, swelling, you know, pain in the belly, pain in the chest, pain in the bones and the joints. Remember, there is help there. If you get, you know, the jaundice, the yellow tint on your skin, you know, you become, you know, pale. Your skin bed is pale. Uh, definitely, please, please, please. Or some maybe acute confusion, uh, slurring of the speech, difficulties mobilizing or talking, visual problems, then please, please, please ring your 111 or 911 or 999 that you have. And that would probably save your life. But remember, the belt where you have malaria is where you're likely to have sickle cell. So I'll rest there and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for having me. I hope I haven't bored you. No, thank you, Mohammed. That was great. And that was ironic, actually, that final sheet that you had there on your presentation, that take home. I actually, because I was doing more reading about sickle cell this week and I found that because I thought it was a fantastic informative chart. And I've put it on all our social media platforms this week, you know, leading up to this event, because I just thought it says so much on there, you know, which can be so informative to someone, especially if they don't know about sickle cell. So I was hoping that people would just click on it and read it and just find out a few things even, you know. But yeah, that was fantastic. Well done. Thank you for coming along and sharing that with us. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I'd echo all of what's just been said and um, I don't know if people have got questions and I've got a couple of daft questions as well doctor so uh, bear with me but on one of the slides it talked about the gen uh, the parents of um, uh, you know whether you've got the trait or full-blown sickle cell does gender have any significance on that so if it's the female that's got the full-blown or the male that's got the full-blown I don't think the gender has any role to play on that. I mean, the no. fact that if you've got, as I say, if you've got a full-blown, yeah. um, you know, and the other one's got a full-blown, then the likelihood of getting a normal child, so to speak, is just zero. Yeah. No yeah. about that. It's so you're Because you see, the child uh, inherits one, uh, 20, there's, there's 46 chromosomes in any human being. 23 they inherit from dad, 23 they inherit from mom. So if mm -hmm. one of those 23 is from mom and mom has got it it doesn't matter whether mom is a man or a woman <laughs> you will just you know inherit it and that's it so it's that's, just uh, you know the I law thought, of uh, if you like yeah that's fine i thought it would be a, a daft question but i'd ask it anyway and no, again right. <laughs> again um hydration was something that you mentioned there as well so does yeah. does alcohol yeah. consumption and and other things you know dry, we've had a hot summer day or two days of it in, in Britain yeah. recently. Does that yeah. increase the chances of crises as well? The alcohol. Ha yes, alcohol alcohol and, and environmental conditions, like we said about the rain. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, as I say, you, you advised that on a, on a cold uh, winter day, I think mm. you advised uh, six to eight glasses mm. of water or, you know, for your hydration purpose. Now, of course, on a hot day, especially for people who have got, uh, you know, uh, an abnormal, if you like, I, I don't like to use abnormal, but a, a, a blood uh, disorder, put it that way, that, that actually makes them prone to, you know, uh, sticking together and swelling and then destroyed way, way uh, earlier than somebody who hasn't got that. Clearly, you, you're more at risk. There's no questions about that. And, and, the, and the more you hydrate, the, the smoother the flow of the blood to, to the organs that need it. Remember, yeah. this metabolism is like taking the nutrition via the oxygen to mm -hmm. the, the, the organs that need it. And then once uh, the metabolism has taken place, the, the end products of that metabolism is then removed again by the blood. So if the blood is not flowing because it's sticky, because it's dehydrated, then obviously, mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm talking about. One thing people don't understand is we look at the human being, nobody recognizes that with all this physique and all that, 70% of that, 
is actually water. Yeah. It's in the liquid status. That's it. So you look at the liver, look at the muscle, look at the bone. You know, instead of the human weight is, is water or if you like liquid, and then 30% is all that solid. So if yeah. you disrupt that balance, that harmony, and say, for example, it's 70, 20, but then there's a deficit of 10, you begin to feel that. There's no questions about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, uh, newly qualified nurses as well. I know there was a um, a big push to try and make sure that um, during that medical training that different skin tones and um, uh, backgrounds were included. Um, is there anything being done by the NHS or the training schools to, to um, include sickle cell as an issue? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm proud to say that this is the, this is the push, you know. And, and, so, and I think what we have, uh, no unless the, the trust is not listed, but all the trust bar none should have of management that has been, if you like, disseminated to all the trusts in the country by uh, the, the NHS and, and the Department of Health. You know, in fact, uh, talking about Manchester, where I am, the, 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 the MRI, which is the largest trust in the country, has made it standard that anybody who comes to the hospital and is to undergo any surgery, they all would have that screening done. Yeah. Bar none, whether you are Caucasian or person of color or whatever, they all would have that reticular site count you know, measured. And of course, that screening would take place. So, because I know they lost somebody who, you know, when you look at him, he was so pale and they thought, oh, this guy would not have that. But of course, he was one of those that required it and sadly, he became hypoxic under the knife and sadly died. So, so the coroner ruled that as a prevention of future death, which is what a regulation 28, it is important to have that as a general rule, you know, that everybody should have that ban on. So that's the only way you can actually ensure that you don't miss anybody that, you know, for example, the one that got away or, you know, you yeah. wouldn't want that. So therefore, everybody is under that and that's it. So everyone should be compliant 100%. Now, whether that's the case or not, I can vouch for everybody, but it should be that okay so um thanks for that uh, mohammed and dr mohammed um i don't know if anyone's got any other questions but I, I can keep asking them if if nobody else um has any at this stage but okay um the uh, folic acid as a youngster i've got fo uh, sickle cell trait and um folic acid was something that my doctor recommended in my teenage years but i've stopped taking it as an adult um as a trait carrier i'm guessing there's no real benefit or you know was, yeah but, but. I, mean, I mean if you're a trait carrier as you say the folic acid as long as you're compliant to the required dose and that goes for all the other vitamins it shouldn't harm you i mean for no. example that's the thing with it so i don't think there's a problem taking it as long uh. as it's within the therapeutic dose yeah. Now, of course, it's very, what's the word for it? A lot of people don't like taking tablets. I understand that. Mm. But, <laughs> but, but the fact remains simple. Mm. You know, it's important to just prevent it. And for me, if you talk to a good doctor, they'll tell you preventative medicine is the best. Yeah. Rather than attempt, uh, you know, at curative medicine. Because if a good doctor tells you I'm going to cure you, then they don't know what they're talking about. Okay. If you prevent it, you actually would be able to do something about it and, and I, I think that's the key so so I, I want to I don't want to digress but I'll tell you a simple story but I work we decided we had uh, the need to measure our vitamin d levels because of covid so mm -hmm. covid is intricately linked with the vitamin d level so I'm digressing a bit but I want you to be to home in on that this is the key issue with the the, the folic acid because of the fact that we have melanin under the skin which is far more than what our counterparts, the Caucasian counterparts have, we then don't absorb these sun rays. And as you can see, happily, or I don't know, is it happy or not? Because it was so bad that a lot of people were <laughs> whinging about it being hot. But how many times do we have in the year this sunshine? So apart from that, we don't have much of it. Apart from that, the, the, the melanin is you know, sort of preventing the absorption. So therefore, the person of color is more prone to low vitamin D levels. Now, therein lies the devil in the detail because vitamin D levels being measured is a very expensive, uh, if you like, uh, procedure, all right? Investigation. So as things stand, the GP is fully aware of the fact that, hang on, mate, 
if I'm going to be measuring, you know, vitamin D levels for all these people, I'll, I'll be bankrupt. <laughs> so, so what they've said is just take it. Yeah. You don't even need to measure it because we in our trust decided we want ours all measured. And they say, all right, you go to your GPs and the GP says, forget that. You're not mm -hmm. going to have that. So what we did, <laughs> exactly. So what we did was to take each and every one of us to encourage each other to take one, that 1,000 micrograms a day. And I've been doing that for two and a half years. And I guarantee you, I'm standing and mm -hmm. not a, 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 a anything to do with COVID as it is. Uh, thankfully, yeah. I've actually dodged it. So it just goes to show you that the folic acid would definitely be helpful within the limit. Yeah. Because if you take vitamin D beyond the limit or it becomes toxic, it can cause stones in the kidney. It can yeah. increase the, the, the pressure, the blood pressure, you know, and, and, and it can cause stones in the ears, which then causes problems with your balance. So there's a lot of things that could happen. That's why it's important to stick to what you should take within that therapeutic dose and yeah. it should be fine. Okay. Thank you again. Um, uh, any questions from the room? If not, I'll keep going for two more. And I just, them I just to silence. asked about vitamin D, uh, like you said, because um, uh, I was looking and it was, um, there's a thing that uh, 1,000 makes no difference to us. So It does. It does. No, no, I, I, I mean, as opposed to taking um, the difference between 1,000 and three or 4,000, because I'll yeah. happily take three of the tablets uh, yeah. or four yeah. which which doesn't seem to have done me any harm as far as i know <laughs> <laughs> well well i mean it, it, it might work you know as an individual it might work you know for you but one thing i know is that there are people who need to be taking twenty-five thousand units a week for example you know fifty thousand units but it's if it's measured so people mm -hmm. who have that need to take it then they definitely would have to stick to that until because I know someone who's taking 25,000 a day until two weeks are thereafter it got mm -hmm. measured again and of course it actually had gone up to the point where uh, they were then reduced to like one to two thousand so so for me if you don't have any signs of the vitamin d deficiency sticking to the 1,000 units a day and for children 400 uh, micrograms a day would be perfect no problems with that yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if you want it to be measured and you've been told that it's way too low, then of course maybe the four thousand might not even be enough for you. So, yeah, so yeah. that's what I'm saying. But one thousand yeah. is good for anybody. In fact, it's half a loaf is better than none, really. That's the yeah. way I look at it. And and can I just ask you about the uh, sorry, sorry, this uh, fresh fruit and veg, because you know uh, Mark yeah. was saying folic acid. Yeah. Uh, you know, you. Uh, I'd, I'd say to Mark, Mark, grow your own, grow your own. Uh, fruit and veg that's a good source as well <laughs> don't be lazy what, a few absolutely more... absolutely I, I will see what i can do about garden box this uh yeah, next good agree, Bob. <laughs> that's it yeah yeah good more advice good diet <laughs> um okay yeah. so i think liz did, did you have i uh, saw any abong did you have your hand up oh, oh I can't good see evening you. everyone i'm sorry i'm so late can you see uh, me we can now. Yeah, I think I can see the hand here. Yeah. Hey, okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Mohammed, it's so lovely to see you. And Thank Sam you so Phil. much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm pleased to see you. Um, and thank, I'm sorry that I missed the talk, but I just was just going to say that I was, um, we ran out of vitamin D in London. <laughs> so just let's leave it there. Because London, there's, 80% of the population, black and white, so the random GP population, were vitamin D deficient. So myself, every um, every winter, I take vitamin D supplements, but um, you must take it with calcium. So, yeah, but the yeah. pharmacists, but the pharmacists run out of calcitry, which is delicious. <laughs> it's a really nice way of taking it. It's sort of like a fizzy lemon sort of taste but it's calcium and vitamin D. And you couldn't get it anywhere in, um, in London for, sorry, for, um, for about two years. So I don't know what it's like in Huddersfield, but vitamin D with calcium is the way to get it into your bones and into your bloodstream as well. But, you know, I think it's, it's important that we take it anyway, as mm -hmm. I agree with what Dr. Mohammed's saying, mm -hmm. because, um, 
everybody's deficient, <laughs> literally everybody's. And it's not just about skin, it's also about muscle and all sorts of the immune system as well. I'm sure you said that, but I'm just reiterating that because um, vitamin D is literally super. Um, but they were recommending taking it to stop you getting um, COVID at one stage mm -hmm. yeah. in the um, pandemic. But, um, you know, I'd still keep my distance from people and wear my mask as well. Yeah. And in people of African you... descent as well should should take it. And we should take a higher 100%. level of it as well, because 100%. it's hard for us to absorb yeah. it anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's what I was told. And, and I was house... like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, and, but also, if you're pregnant or trying to get pregnant, you need to up your dose as well. But, um, okay. you know, it's African. But 20 minutes in the sun, I know you can only do that for two days in a year, but 20 <laughs> minutes here. with half your arm bare, <laughs> yeah. that should do you for vitamin D if you can't, Brilliant. if the chemists run out. Thanks. Thanks, <laughs> Anibon. <laughs> That's just my... Yeah, my... No, no, it's a good point and you made it well, so yeah. thank you. Um, <laughs> just, I, I did say I was going to ask all the deaf questions today, but I think um, Chantel talked about the blood transfusions and uh, obviously we're trying to encourage people to donate. So can either one of you talk about the ratio between somebody donating blood and because and, I think we, we give blood in, in pints or um, litres rather than units. So how, how does that work? Is it... Um, for one person donating, how much is likely to be needed for a transfusion for somebody with sickle cell? I mean, well, transfusion, normally, where I am, um, we don't transfuse anyone who's got um, a hemoglobin level of more than or above 70. Yeah, so that's it. So, so that's standard. Now, yeah. I don't know whether that's nationally agreed, but I know... Anything below 70 would require, for starters, two units of, of blood. That's how it is, you know. Uh, but of course, if it's above 70, then obviously uh, you could, you know, sort of modify that by, you know, taking the iron tablets, depending on whether this is iron deficiency or not. Because sometimes if you do too much of that, again, it's fraught with, with its own problems where you could uh, then get iron overload and all that. So these are all things that are tailor-made for uh, bespoke, if you like, for the individual. So they have to be checked and you yeah. know analyzed, and then that would be good. So I may not have worded the question as well as I should have done, but so yeah. if for somebody who's receiving the donation, um, how many people would have needed to have donated for that to happen? Um, so two units is is that's the uh, fact two hundred and fifty mils per unit. Is that right? Uh, no, I think I think. It's a liter, if you like, because ah. it goes through four four hours. You know, through four hours, the, the one bag or the yeah. one unit of red blood cells will take four hours. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you have two, it's eight hours. This is it because remember, this is cold. You know, yeah. and it's going into yeah. the body, and it has to be vetted, and you know, you name it, all sorts of tests nowadays. Because it just takes one hundred and fifty drops of that blood. If it's the wrong blood, believe me, it will just completely just kill the kidney, and that would cause all sorts of problems. You know. So they, they really are very, very stringent in terms of, you know, checking this thing, sometimes multiple times, you know, two yeah. people, another two people, and then by the end, it's actually, you know, ensured that there's no possibility of human errors or human factors that take yeah. place here. So okay. so the worn bag would definitely last for four hours because it goes like you'd have a normal drip. You know, yeah. that's the thing with it. But okay. As I say, if anyone donates blood, I think normally... You just take it like a, I think one unit, which is normally like a liter and things. Yeah, I don't think they'll be taking. Yeah, they wouldn't take yeah. anything more than that because in itself, no. yeah, I don't know. Of course, people who know lawn tennis, that's how I remember it. If you lose like fifteen love, you know, and then you have thirty love, you know, by the time you go to forty love, well, you're definitely in the doldrums. There's no mm -hmm. question about that. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 fifteen love you can cope with, and that's why after giving that, you probably could go to get a very a hefty breakfast or something <laughs> yeah that's i know i know when i give it and they do say as well because i donate blood every 16 weeks yeah women can only donate it they not donate it less than men anyway because women yeah. have menstrual yeah, cycles yeah. yeah but they tell you as well where your blood's gone which is quite nice because yeah. they'll email you and say your your blood's gone to this hospital or it's gone 
you know, wherever in the country. So that's really yeah. nice that they yes. do tell you that as well. So, yeah. And it's they do... it's encouraging and it's really reassuring in view of the fact that it you is. know you would have made a difference to that kind of, you know, that person, yeah. that, which, as I say, is a rarity, especially if yours is a, it's a B plus it's, it's or a no a, negative. Wow. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, yeah. yeah. And it's the RO as well, because she yeah. did say when, when I first started giving blood and they, they did the tests and that, and they said, oh, you do know how important your blood is. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I said, so I'll be here every 16 weeks giving my blood. That's yeah. not a problem. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's very encouraging. That. Thank yeah. you for doing that. Yeah. No worries. Okay. So if there's no more questions for either Chantel or Mohammed, um, mm -hmm. uh, sis, are you okay? Do, did you want to ask any questions? I don't know if your kids have dragged you away. Or, are you okay with? Oh, you're on mute at minutes. Can't so. hear you, Claire. <laughs> She's over. Oh, yeah, that's She's that. No, that, no um, every question's been answered. That, um, mm -hmm. I've just been jotting down what I need to ask um, my consultant um, for a care plan. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You've um, it's, it's been really, um, really um, good listening to you. So, um, yeah, so I ain't got no questions. It's, it's important, okay. isn't it, Claire, when you come to something like this, you know, you've got a child that's got sickle cell and it's learning. Yeah. You know, you're going to take something away from this, which is yeah. why we do these events, because we feel it's so important, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank All you right. so much. We, we hope we, we've not yes. touched you. No, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, And thank you, Chantel. Really appreciate you coming along this evening to educate yeah. us and to help us understand. She's the star of the show. <laughs> yeah, thank That's you. Yeah. Cell, definitely. <laughs> okay, so um, what we'd normally do at this stage is uh, move to the after hours session, which is just where we have a, a chat and a catch up for what's happened over the past seven days. So um, you're very welcome to stay if you want to, but we understand if you need to leave as well. Um, but yeah, we're just going to uh, talk about the week's events. Right. Um, well, I'll leave you to that. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank no you so much for having me. All right. Any time you want to help out, please give me a shout. All right. We will do. Yeah. Thank we'll you just... so much. Bye. I'm going to go as well. Bye. Bye. Okay. Yes, Thank See you, you later, Claire. Bye. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much for having me, guys. It's been, Bye. It's been amazing. Oh, it's great. Thank you so much. No worries. Chantel. Bye. Bye.